Thanks so much. Uh, it's nice to be here. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about crucial confrontations. Ever had one of those confrontations with someone that didn't go particularly well? And we're going to focus particularly around an area of what takes place in our brain when someone does something we don't like and how we tend to jump to some conclusions about this person. And one of the ways that we're going to kind of look at that today is we're going to be looking at something called the path of action. And this path of action is simply a way to look at sequentially what happens between stimulus and response. I see and hear something, I tell a story about it, it drives feelings, and then I act. And it happens in a nanosecond for most of us. And we begin making some assumptions about why that so-and-so did that. And we do it very, very rapidly. Now, the interesting thing is, is that how you feel is not a function of what you see and experience. If you've ever been one of those persons that said, well, they just push my buttons. Well, I got news for you. It's a little bit of what Eleanor Roosevelt said years ago, that no one can hurt you without your permission. What you see in here has to go through a filter, and that filter is the story that you tell. So again, how you feel is not a function of what you see and experience. It's a function of the story that you tell yourself about what you see and experience. And to me, that has been revolutionary in terms of how I've looked at crucial confrontations. Now, the problem is, is that your body, biologically, is perfectly designed for you to fail often. You have something in the brain called the amygdala. In fact, you have two of them. They're almond-shaped size. You've got one on one side and one on the other side. And the function of the amygdala is to really trace patterns and also to warn you instantly of danger. Now, the amygdala is a very powerful piece of the brain because when it fires a signal, it basically bypasses the neocortex, which is the higher center of thinking, and it says, trust me on this. You don't need to consider it further. This person's a jerk, okay? <laughs> now, that's problematic. Now, there are other times when it actually saves our lives. I was out running with my son here uh, not too long ago, and we were in some back areas, some wooded areas, and we were going along this path, and he was kind of out in front of me, and he rounded the corner, and it was thick enough that I really couldn't see him, but I heard him. And I heard this primal scream, and when I got around the corner, he was just landing from this jump. And I looked, and sure enough, as I got up the path, here was this snake slithering across the path. Now, in that moment, the amygdala immediately triggered, said, trust me on this one. You don't need to think about it. And he did, and it saved his life. So it's kind of something that helps us at some times, but at other times, it begins to kind of work against us. Now, the interesting thing here is that when you think of how the amygdala functions and how we often fire in terms of what we believe other people have done and why they've done that, it gets us into problems. Now, what I've tried to map out here for you is to take several paths of action and put them together because this is more than likely what typically takes place. Uh, we don't just see and hear, tell a story, feel and act. When we act, the other person sees us acting they then tell a story about it, they feel, and they act. Ever been going down the road and somebody practically takes the bumper off? What's your reaction? Blessings on thee, go thy way? <laughs> Probably not. You may question their ancestry. Uh, you know, you may signal that they're numb and worn in your book. I don't know how you handle it, okay? But we tend to do this fairly rapidly. Let me share with you a story that may illustrate this in this comes from my personal life, my family life, actually my son's life, and he's given me permission to share this story with you. And uh, he came home a number of years ago and brought his fiance home. And so we were getting to know each other, and one afternoon he came to me and he said, Dad, I am absolutely starved. Can we go to Don Pablo's, my, my favorite Mexican restaurant? And I said, sure. So we all pile in the car and we're heading down to Don Pablo's, and I can hear him in the back seat as we round the corner. I hear him say, all right, and I knew what he was doing. He had surveyed the parking lot, and he'd figured that the parking lot was half empty. Therefore, when we get into the restaurant, we'll be able to do what immediately? That's right, be seated, and he was interested in chowing chips and salsa immediately. 
Well, we get in and we walk up to the receptionist and she informs us that it's going to be about a half an hour before they can seat us, even though most of the restaurant is empty. Now, that doesn't make sense to him. And so he's kind of mumbling and grumbling and we're talking a little bit about it. And the 20 minutes goes by and she comes back and she gets us and we're now being seated. And uh, I look around and I notice a new waitress. Now, we go to Don Pablo's enough that most of the waiters and the waitresses know the Nelson clan. And they know we can put away a lot of chips and a lot of salsa in a very short period of time. So they all initially bring two or three baskets of chips and salsa to the table. New waitress doesn't know the Nelson clan, and I could see the storm clouds on the horizon. So let me walk you through this, because my son's path of action is in the blue. The waitress's path of action is in the red. Let's walk through this. So she brings a very small container of salsa, small basket of chips. He's ordered water that evening, and literally within a minute and a half, we have finished off the meal, as it was at that point. And uh, he sees the waitress approaching the table. He's sitting on the edge of the table, and this is what he does in terms of acting. He reaches over and he pulls the empty salsa dish, the empty basket, and his empty glass now to the edge of the table. That is what she sees. And in a nanosecond, she then tells a story it drives a feeling, and she stops, and she looks at him, and she acts. And she says, listen, bucko, you want more chips and salsa. Don't shove the basket at me. Got it? And he hears that, tells a story, drives a feeling, and he acts. And I'm holding my breath because I'm not sure what we're going to get here, friends. Now, he doesn't do anything. And I'm saying to myself, unbelievable. Unbelievable. He'd been gone for about a year and a half working with uh, Colin Powell Volunteers for America, and I th I'm thinking to myself, the emotional maturity in this young man is just phenomenal. But I spoke too soon. <laughs> the minute she brings back chips, the minute she brings back salsa, and the minute she sets his cup down on the edge of the table, he picks the cup up and he chugs the whole thing right in front of her, sits it down and smiles. She looks at him, looks at the cup, grabs the cup, takes it back behind her little counter, fills it up again, and comes back by the table as she's going to take the order from the table next to us. Doesn't say a thing to him, simply sets the glass on the edge of the table, at which point he immediately picks it up, and he chugs the whole thing again. So when she is done with the order, she sees this empty glass sitting at the edge of the table. See what's happening here? They have both told stories about each other, and it's driving behavior. She comes back, grabs the cup, takes it back. Now, she does a little calculation this time because she figures she can get more volume of water in the glass if she dumps the ice out, which she does, sets it on the edge of the table, and goes to two tables over to take the order. He immediately picks it up, and he chugs the whole thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, where are we headed? You're right, to the bathroom. <laughs> He's going to have clean kidneys. Now, the interesting thing is, they both ended up engaging in a very interesting form of behavior. They both committed something that we call the fundamental attribution error, and you and I do it all the time. We fundamentally make an assumption about someone else. We jump to a conclusion, and that conclusion then begins to drive the rest of our behavior. And we found victim, villain, and helpless mentality. In fact, when we got out to the parking lot, this was still going on, the fundamental attribution error. Now, when your son becomes 25, 26, you become more of a friend and mentor, less of a parent, if you please. So I walked up beside him, and my wife and uh, future uh, daughter-in-law were a little bit ahead of me, and I simply put my arm around him, and his name is Stacy II. And I said, Stacy, and he said, immediately, I know, Dad, I know. I let her push my buttons. And I said, Stace, I don't think so. I said, I think you pushed your own buttons. And I said, I'll admit, this was an extremely challenging situation for you to handle. And when you consider the genetic inheritance on the side of your mother, it is even more of a challenging situation. <laughs> Just kidding. I unfortunately see a little bit of this in my, my own life that's being passed down. The fundamental attribution error. We tend to assume the worst of other people. Now. If we only learn one thing this session, I want you to remember this, 
that people often let us down for more than one reason. When they fail to live up to a, a promise, you need to expand your view beyond just motivation, perhaps, to ability. In fact, as I inquired into it, I found out that not only was she a new waitress, but the manager that evening had sent home over half of the crew because it had been a very slow evening, and then all of a sudden, there was this onrush of customers. So there were other things playing into this. And often when we commit the fundamental attribution error, we fail to take a look at other possible explanations as to what may be going on. So one of the things that you need to do is learn how to expand your view of others and to begin to avoid the fundamental attribution error. I don't know that you can see this, but this is one of my favorite far side cartoons. In 12th century Pisa, Italy, the construction firm of Morelli and Sons, whose members were all afflicted with a genetic disorder in which one leg was considerably shorter than right, began working on a new tower. Now, you may think these people are just not motivated to build it straight, but maybe it's the way they're holding the plans, right? Looks good to them. You see, organizations don't behave, people do, and they behave for more than one reason. And yet you and I are often falling into this fundamental attribution error. So what can you do here? A couple of tips for getting your heart right because my son needed a heart adjustment that evening. Even though he said to me, Dad, I was just drinking water. <laughs> and I said, oh, Stace. There is drinking water, and then there's drinking water, and you are doing the latter. How do you get your heart right? Well, first of all, you want to avoid the fundamental attribution error by asking two questions. Why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do this? Are they just mean and nasty by DNA? I don't think so. Most of the time, there's something else driving the behavior. And secondly, what, if anything, am I pretending not to notice about my role in the problem? Did he have a role that evening? Now, if you asked him initially, he'd say no. But the more we talked about it, he realized that there was a responsibility to handle this differently. Let me finish off by reading this to you. I don't know whether you uh, have ever uh, heard of this or if this has ever come your way uh, via email, but I think it kind of sums up what we're talking about here. A woman was waiting in an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop and bought a bag of cookies and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She read, munched cookies, and watched the clock as the gusty cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie that she took, he took one too, and when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and he broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude why he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed for the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded her plane and then sank in her seat, and then sought her book, which was almost complete. And as she reached in her belongings, she gasped with surprise. There were her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. Thank you.